Okay, we're recording and yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Wow, there's so many people that attended Seed Stewardship. Um, really excited to uh, share the little that I've learned over the years. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, get to know uh, you a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it's like such a short window of time. So I'll just try to get to um, just kind of covering the basics, pollination, how it works, hybridization. Maybe you know some of these things. I'll try to kind of have little tips and tricks about seed storage. Um, so I'll get right into it and then we'll leave a bunch of time at the end for, um, for sharing. But yeah, just feel free to keep writing your ideas into chat and uh, we'll try to cover them all, I'll kind of talk through them at the end or when we have time. So um, I'll share my screen here. See, I got that. Does everybody see the first slide? Look, okay. All right, so um, yeah, my name's Zachary Page. I uh, started working uh, with White Earth and White Earth Seed Library about 10 years ago. I originally got some of my seed, original seed uh, passion from uh, going to the seed week at Native Seed Search. And the guy that I um, really got me inspired and passionate was Bill McDormand. And he now works with the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and he still does these seed weeks, uh, seed school for an entire week. And uh, it's amazing. Um, we actually sent uh, Susie from White Earth who was interested in seeds out to that Rocky Mountain a, a few years ago. And she was really inspired and um, it's just, there's just so much to learn about the history of seed saving, uh, seed keeping and yeah, Rowan White has also been a pretty integral part of making these, uh, seed weeks. And we did one in Shakopee around 2015, a native seed week, uh, there too. So as we kind of roll through, uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the upper Midwest seed keeping. Uh, Dream Wild Health's work and uh, yeah, some opportunities for the future. But I'll start right now with just some seed saving basics. Let's see if I could. Is that is that working? So, seed saving is tied with agriculture um, and our agricultural history. So. Um, the history is generations, right? It's over 70, 80 uh, generations or more of seed saving. Um, and the basic idea is just, yeah, corn coming from southern Mexico, uh, Oaxaca area, which is on a map. It's, a, it's kind of at the very southern tip of Mexico. And that trail going both ways, right? It went down to South America and it went up through North America. And the different migrations trails um for the little i know about that there's a great book called upper midwest uh or, or upper Mis corn of the upper missouri which is a really great corn migration story that uh, goes into the history there um and there's other migration stories as well like uh robert fox from Arikara, uh has told me corn from south america has come straight up from south america straight up to north dakota area so lots of interesting uh, movement through these last 8,000, 10,000 years. Um, and yeah, it's just about saving the best seeds, right? Like that on that left is a teosinte and on the right is our kind of our naked kernel corn. Um, so people were saving that teosinte in Mexico for a few thousand years. And then one year there's a mutation or and a change and uh, there's no more husk on that teosinte and they liked uh, that quality so they saved those seeds and then at some point those kernels got a little bigger um, probably another jump in mutation or genetics and um, they were saving those corn and there's just there's so much to learn there's so much uh, mystery behind it's not just gen genetics and the spirituality and and everything that's involved with um, just basically and, and it interweaves with our dreams and yeah just dreaming and and having like an idea of what kind of crop and what kind of foods and and having the relationship with us so they're alive those foods are alive those seeds are alive and they're interacting with us too so 
paying attention to that as well um and not just having it one way a one-way street right it's a two-way street so yeah having that intentional relationship over thousands of years just fascinating and um, this is a pretty good book. There's other books out there as well. Uh, Gary Nobbin, who started Native Seed Search, or one of the people that started Native Seed Search, uh, wrote a pretty interesting book about where our food comes from, so it's crop origins. Um, there's maps of bio uh, centers of diversity, and those are mainly around the uh, equator region. So it's kind of interesting knowing like where these foods originally come from that we eat every day, like potatoes and tomatoes come from South America, that which you know, and um, yeah, different uh, crops like apples and garlic, I think come from like the Kyrgyzstan area. So really interesting to know where some things are originally from, but also um, that there's crops that are similar, like wild ginger, it comes from here, but uh, ginger, um, I forget where actually ginger comes from, but um, they're related and they have a lot of similar qualities, but they come from different places. So that's interesting to know as well. So our agricultural diversity historically is extremely rich. Um, people would eat over three to 5,000 species of food. Um, I think uh, there's a, uh, Sam Thayer wrote about how people's knowledge of wild plants generally around 140 plants on a daily basis of daily knowledge of um, the, those were the plants that were used like every day, like about 150 around here. So and we kind of fast forward to today where big agricultural um, commodities and agribusiness and the, the kind of the, how it's tended towards this almost greedy or not almost <laughs> uh, like profit-based food system that we all live in. That's the mainstream food system is, yeah, we just 15 plants um, and eight animals uh, versus that model where we had thousands, right? And then three plants, rice, wheat, and maize are relied on for more than 50% of the world's food, which is kind of incredible how small, how small our windows of crop diversity has gotten. And that info is coming from the Biological Diversity Center. And yeah, it kind of just keeps getting worse. So um, more of these regional networks, more of the uh, food sovereignty networks, the seed sovereignty, all for the better, right? And it's, it's like we're barely making a dent. So every, every person, every uh, nonprofit, every uh, collaboration involved with saving seeds and doing seed swaps is just super important for biodiversity's sake. Some history on um, packets distributed. Um, kind of interesting that the patent office <laughs> in particular was the one that was distributing free seed packets in our country. Um, we hear about land grant universities. So a lot of these uh, universities had ex like active public extension programs that were serving uh, people in that area. And just from this recent history, of course, there's much more uh, rich history before this, but just kind of like talking about what's going on currently, um, just skipping ahead, I suppose, um, to this 1800s. Um, even from that point forward, there's not as many um, publicly available seed programs and extension offices. Like our tribal extension does like a very good job with tribal colleges. And there's a few universities in particular, Oregon uh, and uh, Oregon State University, uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, University and Cornell are like the three big public breeding and distribution for uh, they've got a lot of funding for that public side, but that's it. I mean, there's really not too much more after that. I mean, a lot of universities try, but they're kind of in the pocket of the big Monsanto, Syngentas, so in Bayer now. So this is kind of a map of how much uh, of a true global monopoly. So we said, I think it's uh, three companies now have over 50% of the profits of international seed sales. There's laws against that in the United States, um, monopoly laws. So if this happened in the United States with an industry, this would be illegal, but it's global and there's no global law 
right now from preventing this kind of thing from happening. So just another um, symptom of what's going on with this situation with the um, losing biodiversity. Yeah, just looking at this map over 80 years uh, from 1903 just to 1983, we've lost more varieties before that, we're losing more after that. But look at, looking at this uh, window here, losing hundreds, right? Hundreds of varieties of diversity just because um, commercialization, one of the reasons is uh, just storability. And uh, with anything mass produced, like in an Amazon or warehouse situation, it's easier, right, to make a profit off something that is uh, uniform. So if you create a uniform situation, uh, you're treating the seed like a technology, kind of, right? You're not respecting it for uh, the life that's inside, the diversity, and all these uh, things that provide nutrition and so many other benefits to uh, pollinators and the list goes on and on and on. But looking at food as a commodity or something that can just be kind of bred just for this technology, like we, we need this tomato to store on the shelf for four weeks. And that's the number one trait, right? Because that's the thing that they're going to make the most money at. So not caring about the color, not caring about the flavor, not caring about a lot of things that are really, really important. Um, and also things like um, adaptability. So seeds that are grown year round in Hawaii, um, where a lot of seed companies have their seed produced, isn't necessarily going to do well in an environment like the North or in a different kind of environment, like a wet environment versus a dry. Um, so having regionally adapted seeds is super important for any uh, system, which has been done by tribes since you know, 10,000 years until just about a few hundred years ago. So um, this is just uh, soil health principles, really uh, good to know. This is kind of a sidetrack from seed saving, but um, good info to know, keeping the soil covered, minimizing soil disturbance, um, micronutrients under the ground really form this network of uh, nutrient sharing. And there's so much that we... Uh, don't know about that, but we are learning that the microfungal uh, relationships are really vital and to overtill and to disturb the soil too much, um, create soil erosion and those bonds in the soil that are made by those living, uh, breathing uh, billions and billions of microorganisms are disturbed and they, do, they can't thrive and live and thrive to help uh, provide nutrients to the crops. So they're actually, if you think about it, they're like, they're, they're basically aiding um, getting the, the natural nutrients that are in the soil, like in the depths of the soil into our plants. So the more that we could feed the micro uh, organisms, the better our crops are going to be. But yeah, there's this group, uh, SFA, uh, Minnesota, Sustainable Farming Association, their annual conference is on Friday. So if you're like, hey, I got nothing to do on Friday, <laughs> um, check out them and maybe come to the conference. Uh, we'll be talking about all sorts of really interesting things. Uh, they do really uh, great work with the soil health, but there's other uh, interesting projects that are going on with the SFA as well. And there's chapters, so you like get involved with the uh, with the Duluth uh, area chapter. And there's like budgets for each chapter and harvest parties and just another way to network with uh, sustainable like-minded farmers and seed savers. So this uh, going back to the seeds, um, this is uh, kind of the antidote in a way, or I, I like to see it that way, or I see it that way because there's regional seed companies, all these little seed companies sprouting up, right? And seed uh, organizations and nonprofits and um, they're all working together with the community and um, growing open pollinated seeds that are more adapted to the area. And this is kind of what was lacking in that when those uh, land grant universities went away and also just uh, a lot of the local knowledge might have been lost for a while one way or another. Um, these regional seed collectives have been um, sprouting up recently and some are older but they're good resources so like when people ask me um, like where's it what's a good resource for seeds look at who's doing 
uh, seed work in the state. So I've got this seed company now, North Circle Seeds. We work with a handful of growers. Um, there's a, uh, a few people I think closer to you called Seed Treasures, this couple that save seeds. There's an experimental seed network down in Minneapolis. They grow out seeds from all around the world. Um, and then like David Abbas has the Finland Food Group. He's trying to grow some seeds with uh, people up in the neck of the woods as well. So yeah, just kind of knowing who's around, who's doing what. There's a few uh, really interesting groups in Michigan as well. Uh, Nature Nurture Seed and Ann Arbor Seed Company there. So let's get into seed saving 101 stuff. Um, so considerations at sowing time. So we're at, <laughs> we're, we're right at that right now, right? So this is a good uh, time of year to think about this stuff. And it's a good time of year to plan for seed saving as well, because it will get into why. Uh, so as a crop, a sulfur crosser, so that's the flower. And that's when things are flowering. So it's that time that you'd have to worry about that. And we'll go on to the next uh, slide. Uh, do we need to trellis? So some plants like lettuce and cilantro, um, they will bolt and then they'll produce the seeds. And when you're selecting and going through, you maybe you don't want to pick out the seeds of the plant that bolted first, <laughs> right? Even though it's producing seed first, maybe that's a quality or a trait that you don't want. But if you're planning on seed saving your lettuce and you do let some go to bolt later, um, that plant is just gonna fall down onto the, so on the wet soil and the seeds won't be that great unless you actually trellis that plant. So that's a difference, right? Between just growing for lettuce or growing for lettuce seed. So you have to think about spacing or trellising. Same with cilantro. Um, cilantro grows about three to four feet tall, produces a ton of seeds. So Maybe you just want to let a few plants go to seed uh, at the end of the line or just at the, um, you know, enjoy a bunch of cilantro, but let a few plants go to seed. And another rule that you could think about is a third, one third for seed, one third for food, one third back um, and work backwards. So this one question that's super important is hybrid versus open pollinated or heirloom. Heirloom is not really a scientific word. It doesn't mean much other than um, this is an important heirloom, right? Like an heirloom necklace, like the necklace from Titanic. It was like, uh, or maybe an island Titanic. Um, like an important artifact in your family. So if you had like a bracelet, a family heirloom. Um, but otherwise, it's not really a scientific word. It doesn't mean much beyond that other than um, sometimes people ask for heirloom seeds, they're mainly talking about open pollinated seeds. So open pollinated seeds will grow true to type year after year after year. That's the seed that for that 10,000 years that's been saved. Um, there's been some hybridization going on with some of those plants, but that's not the type of hybridization that we're talking about when we're looking at hybrid seeds. So hybrid seed F1, this is the seed that you know, Johnny Seed Company, they've got a lot of new, like really great hybrids that work well for your organic systems even, and they produce more uniform. They have a little bit more vigor. They're a little bit more uniform um, overall, but it's not necessarily true on every case. And the flavor also is debatable between open pollinated, you get so much more diversity in flavor because there's just more varieties out there that you could potentially make uh, and breed with. And um, hybrids are not reliable to seed save because they have been crossed by two genetically distinct inbred parent lines. So all those genetics will just spill out the, in the next year. It, was, it would be called an F2 generation. And then if you really love the hybrid and you wanted um, something similar, um, through seed saving, it might take up to eight years and you have to go down Mr. Toad's wild ride and just kind of just select and select and select and you'll get there, but it, it will take a while and it might be important. It might be an interesting project to do something like that. But if you don't have the time to do that, um, then open pollinate is your bet. So all seeds we sell, North Circle Seeds, open pollinated. Seed Savers Exchange, all the seeds they sell is open pollinated. 
Um, so yeah, those are the seeds that you can see. So now getting to mating system. So this is when the plant's flowering in that flower stage. Um, so when you see a flower, this is what's happening at that stage. And this is when the plants are doing plant sex. <laughs> so there's no uh, uh, other way to say it. There's uh, the bees are coming and landing on male flowers uh, with the squash plants and then they're uh, spreading that pollen and fertilizing the female flowers. And then there's your fruit. Um, that would be an outcrosser, that would be squash, um, cross-pollination through insect. Corn has cross-pollination through wind. So there's spinach is cross-pollinated through wind. Corn is possible. Uh, the male pollen it lands on the female flower and fertilizes it. And then the selfers, um, like beans, peas, tomato, it's all a spectrum, right? That's why this line is so long because not everything lands perfect. So a pea is very, very much likely uh, to not cross with other pea varieties, even if you plant them like five feet away. But even a pepper who has uh, all the parts of, uh, well, actually, this this will answer that question. So, the sulfur has all the parts, right? It has the male parts and the female parts. You can remember stamen by stamen, maybe it's the male part. Um, I remember sticky stigma at the top, stigma. Someone saying like men and ma, like oh okay, you remember it that way. It's kind of hard to remember all the different parts, but basically on those anthers. Um, that's where the male pollen is. And then it lands on the sticky stigma and it actually grows a pollen tube. See that bottom slide, that yellow. So it actually grows all the way down to fertilize the egg and that's your fruit. So that's your pea, that's your, um, those are the seeds also in, like if it was a watermelon, those would be the seeds. So if you did, well, I, I won't go there yet, but. Basically, these are um, bisexual, complete, perfect flowers. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about beans. Now uh, they have all the parts. They've got those two parts, the male and the female parts. So they're they're basically cloning themselves in terms of genetics. So orca beans, when you plant them, they're going to look like orca beans. And even if you plant them next to another kind of bean, a black bean, it's not going to cross too much. They are, there is some crossing, but really not too much. And then isolation wise, you plant beans about five to 10 feet away from each other, you'll be all good. And this is like the fancy word for uh, the bean family, Fabiaceae. Um, so we'll get into this too. Every species uh, won't cross with something from a different species. Um, so that's another thing to know. Um, so this Latin right here, Phaseolus vulgaris, that's by far the most common uh, bean species. And that will not cross with any of those other ones, even if it was a cross-pollinating species. So here's some P pictures, P some sativum. So knowing your Latin's good, uh, but there are books too to look it up. And one I'll get to at the end, it's called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. Um, really great book they call it like seed saving bible because it's got all the latin and then it even has a lot of tips and tricks on each specific species so if you're going for seed every single species has its own kind of rules and rhymes about it like that spectrum um, line so solanaceae family we've got tomato eggplant potato these are all cousins so a lot of them were um, originated around the south uh, south america so Solanum lycopersicum, that's tomato, eggplant, Solanum mellow, <laughs> mellow Gina. Um, and sometimes you'll have some crossing with these. So tomato, generally not the potato leaf tomato will cross a little bit. Um, generally, if you're looking at like something that I'm doing uh, for seed company, you want to separate your tomatoes by about 50 feet. Um, but if you're just doing a home garden style, um, five to 10 feet is, uh, you know, you'll get like 98, 99%, you'll be okay with not crossing. Um, and then it's a whole different story. And this is a picture of the flower structure again, same thing, perfect flowers, both parts, uh, nice, uh, paste tomato, San Marzano, we grow those, uh, really vigorous. So this is an example of like 
this is a super vigorous open pollinated. So it, co it competes with the hybrid and it tastes really good. And a lot of farms uh, grow San Marzano because it does well. Um, it's just one of those high vigorous uh, open pollinated tomatoes that you grow that work on a, like a farm scale. So uh, eggplants, uh, you want when you're saving the seed, okay, when you're saving the tomato seed, um, you could actually save it right at this stage too. And we'll get to like wet fermentation on how to do that, but you could save it at this ripeness. But with a eggplant, you actually wanna uh, save the seeds when it's over ripe. So a little bit of a difference. Basically the one on the left there, the ripe is ripe when it's white. And then you, it, it's nice that it changes color because then you know it's over ripe. Um, yeah, the African eggplants we grow. And now we have some promiscuous, even more promiscuous than the beans or tomatoes, uh, the, the dreaded pepper flower that it has all the parts, has the bisexual parts of both, but uh, bees love to land on this beautiful little flower, right? Why wouldn't you want to land on that flower? So lots of bees uh, will go and land and then cross pollinate all your peppers. So if you're really serious about peppers, just grow one. That's one way to do it. Just grow your favorite pepper, just that one. Grow a lot. Maybe you could uh, dehydrate them or um, you could can them or freeze them. Uh, peppers actually work pretty well frozen. And then you could grow your other favorite the next year. And then you'd still have some in the freezer, hopefully, or somewhere else. Uh, the other way to do it, if you're a crazy uh, seed person and you really have to grow two peppers, um, we have these cages. I've got, uh, did this with 10 foot electrical conduit pipe. And that's just like a good material to make any kind of hoop. And there's a pipe bender they sell at Johnny's. So it's like 40 bucks. You could bend all these yourself. Um, yeah, that's a cheap way to do it. Cause these pipes are like, I think they're less than $10 what I remember, like maybe five or seven. And then the cloth is a little pricey um, if you get it from like a Johnny's or from a farm place. But basically it's letting light in, but it's not letting any um, pollinators in. You don't need pollinators. They will pollinate themselves, uh, not quite as well, but you can also just lift the sides on one to let some pollinators in and then close it at night. The pollinators actually do leave after night. So you're not trapping them in. Um, and then you could open the other one the next day. So they're not crossing the uh, pollen. Well, I just see what time it is. I can't see the time on the, uh, I'm just gonna see. Okay, we're already at six. Is that right? We're already at six? Wow. Yes. <laughs> okay, there's a little bit more. Sorry to even go over. It's like six oh three. Um, I was trying to go fast, but not fast enough apparently. Uh, should I? <laughs> what should I? What should we do? Should we take questions or just? Uh, are we done at six or six thirty? Uh, six thirty. So you got. Oh, six thirty. Oh, okay. Time, so oh, we got time. I was yep. I was thinking it was over at six. Um, I'll go even faster, so then we'll get um a solid. 15 minutes for a question. So, all right, we'll go back to play from current. Okay, so I'll rip right through some of these uh, lettuce, um, self pollinating. That's a pretty good one, the self pollinating that won't cross. Basically, any of these, if you plant them like side by side, like a red bean and a white bean, okay, you might get some crossing. But if you're spacing, over five, 10 feet for most of these self-pollinating, you're okay. And then 50 feet for commercial. Uh, lettuce are kind of cool. They're fairly easy to seed save. They're what we call like a dry seed save. So basically uh, that picture at the top, that's when it's flowering. Uh, it's got both parts, so it's pollinating itself and it'll dry down. So it'll turn more brownish color. Um, you do want to get them before the wind or the rain gets them. So if you know like a big windstorm is coming and they're generally dry, what you could do is one of two things. You could just chop the plant at the bottom and then um, continue to dry them in like a dry shed where there's some air flow and in a bag, maybe a brown paper bag. So it'll continue to keep drying. 
Um, the other option is if you have like half, some plants will produce some flower uh, seeds, but then they're still going kind of like half of them are still flowering. Uh, you could actually take a bag in the field itself and just knock the plant and knock some seeds into your bag. So then you're like, okay, I got like half the seeds. And then the next time when the plant finishes maturing, then you could, then you could do the harvest of the dried plant and then continue to dry to get as much seeds as possible. So there's this uh, with dry flowers and lettuce and things like that. You do want to go in there mid uh, harvest and get as many dried flowers because they will be keep producing. That's the way I do it. And I find that I get a lot more seeds. Um, and then you're kind of you're hedging your bets, right? Because you're getting stuff in early August and you're getting seeds in September and you're getting seeds. So you're getting them as you go rather than just waiting for one fail swoop harvest. I think that's the way to go. That's what I would recommend. Um, imperfect flowers, these are the two uh, distinct male flower and then a female flower. So this is corn and squash. You can see on the bottom of the squash, the left is the male and the right is a female. And then with corn, the top, the tassel is the male with the male pollen. And then the um, female silks and the corn ear are actually the female part of the female flower. So this is the squash family. So interesting notes, uh, side note is that there, these are all different species. So if you remember, things that are going from one species to another species will not cross pollinate, even if it's a cross pollinating species. So you're growing a butternut, you're growing a summer squash, a uh, pumpkin, you're growing um, a hubbard um, or that cool old squash, um, you're growing a melon or a muskmelon, you're growing a cucumber and a watermelon and they all will not cross pollinate you grow all these one of each and they won't cross pollinate if you grow cucumber to pepo uh, i happen to know uh, is both pumpkin and zucchini so there are like there is a big spectrum there so you just want to watch out for uh, things that might look different but that might be the same species so if you grew that if you grew a pumpkin and a zucchini they would cross pollinate those plants would be fine that year but the seeds inside those plants would be crossed. So if you grew those seeds out, then you'd get a freaky zucchini pumpkin, which might be cool or might be terrible. Um, winter squash. So population, if you're saving seeds, generally with cross pollinating species, one thing to really think about is how many plants you're planting. Because with uh, self-pollinating, all the Gen X are there, right? They're all there in that flower. But with cross-pollinating, you're, you're relying on a population to supply a healthy amount of genetics. So there's, these are like kind of like the more like needy, uh, they're the more community-based. That's why I think like corn is also like this. Corn is so much like people. I think like they look like people. <laughs> they've got arms, they've got a head basically. Um, and they need the community. They need 200 plants at least to save seeds from every year to get that amount of healthy genetics to make it go. Um, you It'll work for five, six, seven years, but after about seven, eight, nine years, you're, if you do just grow like five plants and save from five plants every year, it'll be a significant, your plant will have more disease problems and those inbred problems will start coming into play. So if you're thinking long-term, um, you want to follow some of these um, population size uh, requirements that each species kind of has. So for squash, you want to grow at least 25 plants, not 25 fruits, 25 plants. So it kind of gets a little high sometimes, and maybe it's hard to do if you're just a signal gardener. But what you can do is have a few friends grow the same species, same one, and then you could all swap and share seeds. And then you'll have a good amount of population. Uh, cucumber, same thing, about 25 plants you want to be saving from. Um, so that's what you're saving from. That's what you're selecting from. So if you're really serious, you know, and you can, and you do have the space to grow one of these out, um, and you're thinking long-term and all of that, maybe you want to be growing 100 or 200 plants to be able to save 25. But like I was saying, if you're growing 25 and five other people are growing 25, between all of you, if you only select from five, then you're all good. So that's why another reason why the community seed saving is so important. Um, broccoli is another interesting one, or this 
species called Brassica oleraceae. So that's these are all the same species: uh, broccoli, cauliflower, collard green, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, and cabbage. And maybe they were starved of diversity in Europe <laughs> because they stretch this thing out, right? They really stretch the genetics to be a lot of different, showing a lot of different attributes. Um, but if you're trying to save seed, it's a bad thing because um, you're growing out your broccoli for seed, but your kale is also flowering and this is a cross pollinating species. So you're in trouble. So if you are growing for seed, just grow one of these. Um, one of them out, one of them's flowering at one time. So when those mustard flowers are out and you are saving for seed, just, yeah, make sure it's just that one. So that's what the mustard flowers look like. It also looks like wild mustard. Um, these are insect pollinated. The insects will travel up to a half mile. So that's like more of a difficult, slightly more difficult one to seed save potentially, especially if you got wild mustard going in your farm, because that'll also be a problem and cross into and not be a reliable um so if it was like broccoli and then you get the wild mustard all around it or something else basically the next year like all those wild mustard traits would go into your broccoli and it'd just be very odd looking plant uh carrots a biennial so some seeds actually flower in the second year um, and then the first year, a lot of these are root crops like onion, beets, carrots. So we do a lot of carrots and North Circle seeds. I got into it a long time ago. So I got it. Got it. This is one that I feel comfortable with, pretty comfortable doing. Uh, if you have any carrot saving questions, um, it, it's actually very similar to beets too, and also pretty similar to onions. But you're storing the carrots themselves, you select them, um, put them in wood shavings over the winter at like about 35 degrees, 33 degrees, uh, make sure they're wet. And then they store into the spring and you actually plant the carrots. Carrots produce these beautiful flowers. Um, the only thing is you have to worry about Queen Anne's lace. If you've got that, that'll cross. And it's cross pollinated by all these little bugs and ants. Um, but yeah, carrot is a fun one. Corn, these are the female flowers, the silks that'll accept the pollen, grow that pollen tube all the way down to the kernel. And then your kernel is your seed. So we already talked about hybrid heirloom. Selection, you could do any time. Um, it's actually better to do it all like thinking about it the whole time if you are thinking about seed saving. Um, so if any problems going on with a, say one is like noticing, you're noticing some disease or, um, you know, these ones aren't growing as well. Anything that you think is a good reason to it's called roguing out or uh, you're basically selecting out the genetics. Uh, you could do it before flowering. So the reason for that is say like a corn plant has like a bunch of rust on it and you're like, I don't want that, you know, to follow through to, with the genetics. I don't like that disease. So you, you would hopefully uh, take that plant and pull it out of the ground and just put it in your compost before it flowers, because if it flowered already, then the genetics are already out there, right? And you could pull it later, but then you're only saving those genetics, but then you may have saved more if you pulled it before it flowered. So tomato seed saving, the wet method, um, this is the ferment stuff. So you're putting your seeds into a mason jar, you're adding some water, you're waiting about, uh, depends on the temperature, but until there's mold at the top, you kind of see in the mason jar is a little bit of mold. And then you do this water winnowing where you blast water into it and you uh, pour out the dirty water and they keep putting water in. And the magic of this is the density of the good seeds will always go to the bottom of your bucket. So you just keep water, uh, water winnowing, uh, pouring out the dirty water, keep putting clean water in until your water is clear and clean and then you could dry them and then you wait i have an excalibur dehydrator that um, works really well it uh, has a function where there's no heat so that's another thing to know you don't want to have heat on your seeds that you're drying you just want a lot of airflow and if possible some low humidity situation right, this is being recorded so i'll just stop oh yeah um, yeah, I'll just run through dry seed processing. This is um, you know, similar to um, yeah, the same 
method I was talking about the lettuce. So uh, the seeds are drying down, the flowers are drying down. Uh, the real tough part a lot of times is the uh, winnowing. So you got your beans, they're all in shells, uh, they're all in the pods and they're dried. You want to wait typically to pick uh, like something like beans and most things when it's got that buckskin color um, and when uh, the shell of the plant is actually crumbly or dry noticeably. And then when you shell them, um, you could do it, use your creativity, uh, jump on them, uh, just you're getting the seed out from the shell and that's the threshing Though sometimes the hard part is a winnowing. Um, and that's this guy at the top has got that fan. So that's a really good way. Um, you're dropping your seeds, the seeds will fall and you're using gravity. The wind uh, will carry the shaft away and your seeds will get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. The more times you do something like that with a, with a fan, with box fan and hold it above that fan and just drop stuff. Um, Seed dryers, uh, yeah, just plenty of airflow. Um, yeah, you get fancy with moisture meters and whatnot, but basically you can use the space heater to make sure it's not going too hot. Generally seeds, it's not good for seeds to be hotter, any hotter than like 88 degrees. Uh, so if you're like well over hundred with your heater and it's getting too close, like tone the heater down. But on the same time, if it is like wet and you just went and harvested all that corn is wet out, you just want to make sure it's dry pretty quickly. So maybe turning on a heater just to get it dry um, initially and get some wetness off of it if you had the harvest in a wet day. Typically, you want to dry uh, harvest dry seeds on a dry day. Um, seed storage, temperature and humidity, less than 200, uh, 100, sorry, um, Fahrenheit. Um, you don't want to put seeds in a place where the... Um, the temperature or humidity going up and down and up and down. So um, if you can, you could seal stuff in jars. You put silica gel packets in. That's a good um, way to do it. And then you could keep it in your basement as long as it's sealed because basements have high humidity, but they are good places for uh, not having temperatures go up and down and up and down. So, and, and dry and dark. So I don't know how much time we have now. 620. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, seed rematriation projects. We're working with Dream Wild Health. I work with White Earth. Um, we're bringing seeds back from the Science Museum. That's what this picture is. Scott Shoemaker kind of started this idea uh, with that Minnesota Science Museum. So uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. Maybe uh, Caitlin could be a point person. Um, and we've been growing out the striped man and squash. We've been growing a Jibwe corn. Uh, it's a white corn, kind of interesting seeds that they have there. They're part of a collection and they're trying to grow them out little by little. They don't have a lot of resources. So we're basically doing the best we can with trying to grow out stuff. Um, their seeds are alive and they're in and they're treated like museum artifacts. So we're trying to get them out and get them back to tribes. The man then uh, squash story was a good success. Some of these seeds are dead. A lot of them are dead, but this one wasn't and it grew and it looks beautiful and we sent like thousands of seeds back to the mandan tribe and we've got a lot of those um they had some uh bear elephant as well those didn't grow but we also have bear elephant from other sources um yeah and we've uh with this upper midwest seed um network we've had terry lynn brant from most uh, mohawk seed keeper out a bunch um Brown White, um, now Jessica Green Deer from Ho Chunk is working with Dream Wilds Health, and they're doing a lot of that networking. And I think they're doing a big rematriation project with Seed Savers Exchange as well. And yeah, some chefs that we work with, Sean and Brian Yazzie. Um, I won't talk about my projects, but White Earth Mobile Market, we're just going around as a mobile grocery store, um, uh, buying in native uh, produced foods, and then as a mobile grocery store, just distributing them throughout the reservation. And then, yeah, Seed to Seed. This is the Seed Bible book. Um, that's the best one I would recommend, the one I like to use at least. And yeah, I'll we'll just leave it there. Here's some contact info. And we got a solid 10 minutes for questions. Let's see how I can. 
so yeah right uh if you're interested in my email write it down now um, and then i'm gonna stop sharing in about 10 seconds <laughs> well thanks everyone um think about any questions about uh, particular questions about what we talked about um following up on i also have seed uh pamphlets i could give to you um Caitlin uh, to distribute they kind of just like basic stuff to know uh, about the self pollinating cross pollinating hybrid versus open pollinated some of those bigger topics to kind of just because there is so much and then I guess my last point um, would be is um, try to just pick like one or two seeds to save uh, it's always the best because then you're really just concentrating on one or two things and so it doesn't get too overwhelming. You can try to do a whole bunch too, but I don't know how we should do the question. Should I just read them or are they to everyone? Yeah, most of them to everyone, so. Yeah, I don't, let's see. I don't know if I saw any questions, but some comments for sure. I know that one person was wondering about um, how to protect corn. Deb, was there, did you get enough info or, or is there more that you wanted to hear? Oh, can I could, I could like one more thing or hmm? some things about corn. Some people say um, you could do different timing. Like don't do that in Minnesota. I just, I don't recommend it. Um, cause one thing that happens with corn and plants that cross pollinate, even if you cross, if you, if you plant like one May 18th and it's growing and it's great. And then you grow the next one starting at like June 18th. So you think this pollination window is different than this because it's later. Um, that's not a great method in Minnesota because they tend to catch up to each other because they want to join the party <laughs> the pollination party. Um, so and then also our season just so short. So I wouldn't recommend that. But the thing that I would recommend is just growing one type of corn. And then um, just using your eyes and observation, uh, corn pollen can travel up to two miles. It can travel up to five miles. Um, but that's generally in a straight shot in North Dakota, high wind situation. Um, I live in a rolling hills area and there's big 200 feet or 100 foot at least maple trees that are that spans about 50 feet between my fields and I'm not worried at all about planting uh, one corn um, and then after that uh, tree break of you know about 50 feet of trees that the pollen's the pollen's not going like in between the <laughs> trees I mean there's a very 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 slim chance but um, you know, so there's different like blockers. So if you're on like one side of the farm and then you're on the other side of the farm, um, you'll be okay. As, uh, the general uh, rule for cross spawning corn is 660 feet if it is a straight shot. So that's like a 99% chance that you're going to be okay if it's about 600 feet away. But most of that pollen's like going down like around like a 20 or 30 foot area. So I don't know if that helps. You can do also hand pollination. Um, it's fun. You're using bags um, and you're identifying all the ears early and you're bagging them before they sulk. Uh, so nothing is pollinating them. And then you're later, you're going in with your tassel bags that you collected pollen from and you're, you're doing each corn yourself. So if you're getting that um specific onto each one you could do it that way too and if you i guess lastly if you want to have fun and make a hybrid like i did with the i had a yellow corn and a white corn sweet corn i want to make a bicolor corn so i just took off all the tassels detasseled so that one has no male pollen um so you're you're creating like um a specific hybrid but yeah and um yeah, we did. We were going to have Lolly Aguilar teach last week, and I know she knows a lot about corn too. So hopefully, Deb, we can get her to come. Yeah, Lolly's great. Season. Yeah, learn, learn all about corn. Um, and then someone was wondering are there any alternatives to silica gel to keep uh, the seeds dry? There probably is because nature is so, has so many. I wonder if, I don't want to say anything because I don't know. 
um have some ideas but silica gel there are there is a reusable so silica gel so if you're and it doesn't do any damage it's it's not really like a, a harmful chemical at all it's basically on the line of sand so there are these reusable types of silica gel where they change color um so they'll suck up a certain amount of moisture and they'll actually change to like a blue color and then um, you can lightly heat them and then like an oven and then they'll go back to their original state. So if you're worried about waste, uh, there are reusable versions. There's also just the packets that you find in your shoes. Um, silica gel really does work though. Like we did a germination uh, of a bunch of really, really old seeds. And we found just by seeing what germinated, the silica gel really kept the seeds for a lot longer um, when you put them in. But the, the real thing, though, is um, you want to be using your seeds, right? You don't want to store them for 10 years. Typically, you're growing seeds. You want to grow them every, like, year or two or three. So most seeds, the bigger the seed, the longer it'll store. That's another general rule. So if you've got a corn or a bean or a squash seed, they're going to last. You know, if, if it's a good condition, if they're dried down, uh, all those varieties will last uh, more than five years for sure and up to 15 years uh, pretty well. Um, so just make sure your seeds are dry. And then a lot of the other smaller seeds, uh, like tomato, they might last up to five, six years, seven years too, pretty on a pretty good germination. The only things that you really, uh, and every species is different, but, uh, lettuce and dill, uh, seed and carrot seed, like after two, three years, it just drops off. So every, everyone's got their own thing, but that's something to be mindful of though. Like how long will your seeds last? So if you have this important corn, you know, maybe you don't, you want a good condition and you will want to wait two, three years before you get that. But if you have the same thing going with a dill, you wait two, three years, you might have zero ger germination. So something to consider. Okay. And that's seeing. Oh, uh, if you're, if you're trying to be thrifty to, uh, uh, Amazon or uh, you could buy bulk. So I buy a bunch of bulk silica gel packets. Um, so that gets cheaper too. And the bigger the bulk and <laughs> the more you save, you can give them out to your friends. Um, and you get different sizes. So you can get a big size for big seeds and small size for small seeds. And I usually just throw a bunch, pretty liberal about it into a lot of the storage. I'm sorry. Yeah, the rematriated seeds. Um, what were some of those seeds? So yeah, we had the, there is an Ojibwe white corn. Um, probably after this year, we could give out well have enough. We've only got like a small mason jar right now um, from like two years of growing just that. They're like four foot tall. So they're pretty small. Um, and they're small cobs, like three inches, but they're pretty, um pretty beautiful they're like they've got eight rows they've all got eight rows so that's like a trait that um is within that variety and they're like a white flower uh so you you make hominy out of it and grind it as well but we'll just keep growing it until we get a lot more share um yeah growing a bunch of beans and we're growing some beans with the college as well too but yeah, thanks everyone. Um, got one more minute though. I don't know. We have any more questions? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I know I wanted to add to um, that uh, Gitagon and Fond du Lac, we have some seed keeping supplies um, that we're starting to have at uh, Na and Nemo Nigamig, the uh, commercial kitchen that's out at Gitaganing out at the farm. And so if folks are getting interested in seed saving, we have some materials that we could share and space and then just contact me if you want to access those or have ideas of what, for what we yeah. should have out there. Uh, I see this Susan Connor just before she leaves. Um, so the carrots, um, mm -hmm. there could be a number. If you want to email me, um, basically uh, the thing that it seems like maybe is they weren't wet enough. They have to be really, really, really wet up to 99%. But yeah, every... Like I was saying, like every species has its own thing, but um, the way I do carrots is to store, and this is great knowledge to just store carrots too um, and wood shavings. Um, 
is you got your wood shavings um, and then you'll space the carrots out so they're not touching each other um, and then put more wood shavings on then space your carrots out more wood shavings do like four or five so you got like a bin spray liberally spray water on top um, so they're just very very wet um, not like soaking but uh, very wet and then the ideal temperature is 33 degrees so as close as uh, as low as you could possibly get maybe you have a friend that has a a walk-in fridge um, and you could get it kind of low 40 degrees will probably be just fine as well and then uh, just make sure throughout the winter that they're they're wet the other way to do it is if you did all that in a paper bag and they're really really wet put that paper bag in a plastic bag and poke some holes in it so just so it could respire and breathe and then put that that would actually fit in your fridge then so if you just had like 20 carrots or something like that you could just shove it in the back of your fridge and forget about it um yeah but just make sure yeah the wood shavings are like almost to the point of soaking but not like puddling up with water because you could get mold and you do want to cut the tops of the carrots off like about an inch or even a half an inch so because the uh, plant material will die and that could also be potential moldy but that's a carrot we've got a video on our i'll, I'll throw a link on our website so if you are, I guess, like last pitch, shameless promotion, North Circle Seeds, um, uh, I'll throw in a promo code that's going on right now. Uh, where it's spring sale, 15% off. Um, we've got videos. Um, I think it's spring sale 22. I'll put it right here. Spring sale 22. 15% uh, off all seeds. So thanks for joining the class and you all get the 15% off discount. If you want to support the uh, Minnesota growers and the North Circle Seeds, we grow everything in um, in the North. So everything's adapted to short season and they're all open pollinated. So you can save the seed and then put us out of business. That'd be good. <laughs> Well, that's what I love about what you said. It's, you know, kind of starting small and that we're supposed to do this as a community that it's not, yeah, something we can all do um, together. So miigwech so much. Yeah, thank you so much for um, teaching. Thanks everyone for joining us um, and then hanging in with us uh, a little bit with the uh, last two weeks when we had last minute changes. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, yeah. Just so oh, sorry, one last thing. If you don't, you know, have money to buy or don't want to support and by buying seeds um we do have a subscription for north circle seeds too so i do these classes every once in a while and i'll let you know about like class number two or you know, maybe we're going to do a seed storage one um so if you go to the bottom of the website and subscribe um then you'll get those i don't send them out like a lot just maybe once every two or three months um, when we have a few things or a schedule of educational events and stuff like that so Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your generosity with that. And um, yeah, I'm going to stop the recording. And thanks again, everyone, for attending and for hanging on a couple extra minutes. I appreciate it. We'll see you next week.